Well, hey everybody, we are back here uh, for our next week of discussion. Sorry these videos are coming out a little late this week. Uh, it's spring break for the on-ground crew at UC, and uh, I've been a bit busier at my other job, uh, so I uh, beg your forgiveness there. But nevertheless, here the videos are, and hopefully they will help ease up the understanding a bit. So this week we're talking about the problem of evil. Or in other words, why do bad things happen to apparently good people, or why do bad things happen to anybody at all? And so when we talk about evil, it would kind of help to divide the concept of evil into two categories. Uh, first, we're going to be talking about moral evil, and this is what we mean when we talk about the bad decisions that people make. You know, somebody decides to go out, buy a gun, point that gun at another person and pull the trigger. They made a decision, or a series of decisions, that led to an evil act. So that's moral evil. Now, we've also got uh, a category that we would call natural evil. And the quickest way to sum up natural evil, shit happens. It's just that random stuff that happens. It's earthquakes, it's hurricanes, it's uh, things that really aren't anyone's fault, things that couldn't be avoided, but are nonetheless bad, or we would at least define them as bad. And so as we go into talking about the problem of evil, we're going to be talking about these two different kinds. So a, a little more about the problem of evil itself. So that's evil. We've defined evil, moral evil and natural. We're also going to look at the problem of evil. Okay, so the problem of evil is this. You have four truths that, and of these four truths, any three of them can exist together uh, without being contradictory, but not all four. And the four statements are these, the four truths, apparently, or the, the four posited truths. First, God is omnipotent, meaning that God is all-powerful. Second, God is omniscient, meaning that God is all-knowing. Third, God is omnibenevolent, meaning that God is all good. And then fourth, evil exists, as we had just defined evil as both moral and natural evil. Now, any three of these can exist together, but not all four. You can have a God who is both omnipotent and omniscient and, om and omnibenevolent if you deny the existence of evil. Likewise, you can have a God who is omniscient and omnibenevolent, who knows everything and is entirely good, those two can exist with evil, uh, as long as God is not all-powerful. So God knows about the, the bad things in the world, God cares about the bad things in the world, and there are bad things in the world, it's just that God is powerless to do certain things. You can have a God who is both omnipotent and omnibenevolent, um, and ex evil exists, but then you'd have to eliminate the omniscience of God. And uh, in th so in that situation, God can do anything, God would do anything if God could, and evil exists, but that you have a situation where God doesn't know about some of the evil in the world. Uh, likewise, you could have a God who is omnipotent, a God who is omniscient, omniscient and the existence of evil. So in that situation, you ha would have a God who knows about the bad things in the world, who could do something about those things, but frankly doesn't care. So, that is the philosophical problem of evil. Oh, and, excuse me, we have a guest lecturer here. Uh, this is uh, Dot, the cat, uh, who has just decided to uh, interfere in the lecture. So, thank you, Dot, for your thoughts and words. And nobody wants to see your butt on camera, so go over there. I apologize for the interruption. All right, so moving on from the problem of evil, um, we come first to the, the you're reading this week from uh, D David Hume, and David Hume he's sort of setting out our initial problem of evil, and he talks here about all the different kind of em enemies that human beings face. He talks about natural enemies, uh, imaginary enemies, which are things like superstition, societal enemies, like injustice and oppression, and internal enemies, the enemies of the mind, things like fear and shame and remorse. And uh, he, he delineates all of these different kinds of enemies, and I'll leave you to read that yourself. 
Um, this is, by the way, for, for those who aren't following along in the textbook, um, which hopefully is everyone in the class, but uh, for those who are just following in YouTube world, um, these are selections from David Hume's Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. So Hume uh, delineates the four kinds of enemies that human beings face, and um, also asks the question, well, you know, in the face of all these enemies, why do people stay alive? Uh, surely there's something joyful and happy in the world that keeps us going, and uh, Hume posits that no, there's actually not. It's just fear that keeps us going. We, we fear death. We don't know what's on the other side of it, um, and so we keep ourselves alive because of that. Um, and it, uh, the way Hume says it is that we are terrified, not bribed, into the continuance of our existence. Um, likewise, in life, Hume says that pleasure is always mixed with pain. There's no such thing as pure happiness. And in the end, Hume says it's impossible to conceive of or to believe in um, a uh, omnipotent and omnibenevolent being in the face of so much evil and suffering. And so that's where Hume comes down, sort of in a very basic form, sets out the, pro the philosophical problem of evil. You're also reading this week from uh, Gottfried Leibniz, who is, uh, it's just from his book, The Theodicy. And that word theodicy, by the way, is a word that we're going to come across a lot in this section. Um, a theodicy is the, the word that we use for a kind of a theory that claims to set out a reason for why God allows such suffering to exist. So, or, or more specifically, a theodicy sets out how it is that what appears to be the, the problem of evil is not actually a problem, that you actually can reconcile all four of those apparently contradictory truths. And uh, Gottfried Leibniz, uh, in his work, The Theodicy, sets out one way in which he thinks that might be the case. Um, he admits um, here that the, the, he, Leibniz articulates the problem of evil in this way. Uh, one, whoever does not choose the best is lacking in power, knowledge, or goodness. Two, God did not choose the best in, create, in creating the world. In other words, we could conceive of this world being better than it is. And three, therefore God has been lacking in power, knowledge, or goodness. Um, and uh, Leibniz's argument against this is that he, he believes that God allows a certain amount of evil in order to bring about a greater good. Um, and in this he refers to what's called the felix culpa. And that's Latin for the happy sin. And Gottfried Leibniz is dealing with this question of allowing evil to exist in order to accomplish a greater good. He's, he's setting that question within the context of Judeo-Christian mythology. So he explores specifically the story of the so-called fall of humankind in the Garden of Eden. For those who may not be familiar with it, this is the story in the uh, chapters 2 and 3 of Genesis um, from the Jewish scriptures. And in these chapters, you, you have the story of the Garden of Eden, and you have Adam and Eve being created, and uh, they're naked in this sort of innocent state. And then uh, along comes this snake, asking them to, or, or sort of tempting them to eat from the fruit of this tree that they're not supposed to eat from, and they eat it, and literally all hell breaks loose. Um, and uh, I, I would encourage folks to read it. You can find copies of that story online. It's uh, chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Genesis. Um, and th this was considered to be, by um, especially a lot of Christian theologians, the fall of humankind from a state of goodness to a state of sin. And uh, th the question arises, well, if God is all-powerful and all-good and all-knowing, couldn't God have stopped this evil from happening? Uh, why did God allow this evil? And Leibniz says, well, God allowed the evil of the fall in the Garden of Eden and again, Le Leibniz would take this story a little more literally. Uh, that God, Leibniz allows the fall, or Leibniz says that God allows the fall in order to accomplish a greater good, which, according to Leibniz, is the incarnation of Christ. That this is an infinite good compared to a finite fall. And so, in Leibniz's case, uh, the the Felix culpa is justified, and so God even though the world isn't perfect and there's been a, a fallout from this uh, from the fall 
in, in the Garden of Eden story, uh, Leibniz would argue that it's worth it. That the 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 infinitude of the goodness that was accomplished by the incarnation of Christ outweighs the the finite fallenness. So um, th that's a quick summary uh, of the uh, problem of evil and um, human liveness. We're going to be talking about um, both uh, uh, Hick and Mackey's arguments next. Oh, and our guest lecturer is back. Um, once again, Doc, ladies and gentlemen. All right. I will see you in the next video, hopefully, uh, sans feline. Where's my mouse? There it is.